we're thrilled to welcome Madison Masayali, uh, co-founder and CEO of Deep Cell to the show today. Madison, thank you once again for joining us. Thank you for having me. Let's kick things off. Madison, uh, can you share a brief personal intro with us? Sure. Uh, I'm Madison Masaili, uh, co-founder and CEO at DeepCell. Um, I, my background is in engineering. Uh, I got my bachelor's in electrical engineering back in Iran. I moved to the U.S. to continue my studies and uh, got a PhD in bioengineering. Um, I was mainly focusing on uh, developing technologies for single cell physical and mechanical phenotyping, which is very much related to what we do at DeepCell. After finishing my PhD, I joined a uh, biotech startup in the Bay Area for a short period of time, uh, decided to go back to academia, and joined UN Ashley's lab at Stanford as a postdoc, and there together with him and my other co-founder, Mayar Saleh, who was at um, uh, Google at the time, we conceptualized the idea behind Deep Cell. And in um, November of 2017, we spun the company out of Stanford, and we've been on this amazing journey ever since. Oh, it sounds like a really exciting background bringing together a number of different elements we'll be diving deeper into but before that can you just give us a brief overview uh, of deep cell itself absolutely uh, so deep cell is basically a platform for uh, next generation single cell um, deep morphological analysis we uh, intend to bring morphology to the uh, multi-omic analysis era uh, by creating a new ohm that we call morphologics um, so the morphologics is basically the ability to do deep morphological interpretation and quantifying that at scale and in interpreting that and incorporating that uh, and integrating it with other ohms uh, like the genome, the transcriptome, the uh, proteome, et cetera. Um, so what the technology is, is basically combining the power of computer vision, AI, and advances in microfluidics and imaging to basically create high dimensional interpretation of the single cell image and uh, to use that interpretation in real time to isolate and purify cells based on the way they look. Um, that's in a nutshell what the technology is and what we intend to do with it. Well, I, for one, am incredibly excited. I have a number of questions right off the bat. I'm going to turn it over to Michael so he can kick things off. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. And yeah, excited to learn more. So we'll start with the, uh, the very first question to kick things off. Would you mind sharing a bit about the founding story of Deep Cell and how everything came together? Was there a specific spark that started it all? Yeah. So um, as I mentioned during my PhD, I've been spending a lot of time looking at the cells, looking at me mechanical phenotyping of the cells. And even at that time, it was very much clear to me that uh, looking at different uh, biological processes, the mechanical profile of the cell is very much linked with the visual profile of the cells. Um, so when I left PhD and then after a, a short journey in the, in the industry, uh, when I joined you in Ashley's lab, my main project was basically looking at differentiating uh, induced pluripotent stem cells into cardiomyocytes. And what we were interested in was to study disease looking at mature cardiomyocytes. So if you're familiar with, with this field, um, a dominant signal of maturity of cardiomyocytes is their size or their volume and some other aspects of the way that, the, that those cells look. Um, so it also kind of like all of that uh, background and this new project uh, was directed towards looking at phenotyping cells. And so this part was basically when I got to know my co-founder, Mayar, who has a background in computer vision and AI, and who was developing products at Google with um, AI and computer vision at their center. And talking a little bit about the problems that we were facing, the aha moment was really just to think about whether we can automate this inspection of the way that the cells look or the volume of the cells using computer vision and, and artificial intelligence. So that was perhaps the first time that the three of us together with you and Ashley conceptualized this idea of bringing AI and computer vision to automate 
uh, phenotyping of cells uh, for the purpose of, for example, detecting mature cardiomyocytes. And then a quick twist after that was whether we can use this uh, profiling uh, and the AI capabilities in real time to actually purify for cells of interest. Uh, if you're familiar with stem cell differentiation, a lot of time the researchers are using iPSCs and differentiating cells to create better models to study disease. But a lot of time, the process of stem cell differentiation is very inefficient. And you end up with a pool of cells, most of which are not the cells that you're actually interested in to do your the rest of your um, study. So the idea was whether we can actually use AI and computer vision, use it in real time, use it in active mode to isolate cells that look like the cells that we were looking for to then do the rest of our study. So that's basically uh, what drove the idea behind uh, you know, bringing um, AI and deep learning, adding it to microfluidics and optics, uh, and kind of creating this platform uh, for identification of, and sorting of cells uh, with uh, with deep learning. Um, so from there, we had a few conversations with academics, with investors, with folks who have been innovating in the field, and we quickly realized that the breadth of application is huge, and in some areas it could actually become the gold standard or, or what folks have been con conceptualizing, as, uh, co conceptualizing as the holy grail of, of a few of these fields. So that got us really excited about uh, bringing it to the world and making it accessible uh, by others, uh, which uh, is the story of Deep Cell. Well, that's a great introduction. And really the, the applications and the team, it's, it's such an exciting time to be you know, working on this project. And so um, with that, we'll take it the next step in and, and ask if you could share a bit more of an overview about um, single cell imaging and analysis and provide a bit of context into the unmet needs in that particular area um, as you're looking to, to innovate in it. Yeah, absolutely. So I think they um, need to do single cell analysis uh, or the, the advancements that uh, it could bring to the field was known when I was getting my PhD, I think it was around like 2010, 2011, was that there was a lot of excitement around doing single cell analysis uh, because the biological samples are so complex and understanding and predicting the response of a, of, of a patient, for example, to a therapeutic or diagnosing a disease by looking at an average profile of a sample is very challenging. There is just so much heterogeneity and diversity in the composition of the cells within a biological sample that without having this resolution, it's very difficult to go to the next step and, um, and actually uh, learn about um, uh, outcome, for instance. Um, so the interest in, in single cell analysis and looking at, at biological samples at that resolution exists across the board in many, many different fields. Morphology and cell imaging being one. Um, so you're looking at a lot of uh, you know, still today the diagnostic uh, capability of uh, morphology is, is very much known. Um, so for, for instance, um, I think uh, one of the fundamentals of biology is, is the way that the cells look. Biology was defined by looking at cells under a microscope and describing what you see through the lens of a microscope. Um, so it's it's today still the perhaps one of the most widely used analyzed or characteristics of cells to understand biology. For instance, still uh, identifying different blood cell types for diagnosing and staging cancer relies a lot on a pathologist or a cytologist's ability to uh, identify visual distinctions of cells of interest. But that also has been mostly done on a sample level. So a pathologist or a cytologist looks at a slide, looks at all the cells within that slide, and detects some uh, features about the background cells or perhaps abnormal looking cells like malignant cells and draws a conclusion based on that. So that also needs to go through the revolution of single cell ana analysis because there is a huge amount of heterogeneity there. And on top of that, with morphological analysis or visual analysis, there is a level of uh, subjectivity and, and the challenges with uh, the interpretation of the experts that are looking at the image. Um, so that's why we're interested in, in bringing single cell quantitative analysis to the, the uh, visual data and information of the cells, which is a rich, uh, basically, uh, 
analyte to look at, but it has been prohibitive, like the, the challenges in the technology have been pro prohibitive to bring it to the next stage. Yeah, thank you for that introduction. And, and really the single cell kind of revolution in biology has been so exciting to see already. And to your point with all of the um, kind of subjectivity, the, the inefficiencies with trying to do things by hand or just some of the information that you miss when you include say bad cells into a batch. Um, really, there's a lot of opportunity for innovation. So we're interested if you can chat about um, the product that you're building um, and, and how you see it solving some of these issues. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So um, as I mentioned, uh, and you also uh, pointed out, uh, a lot of challenges with quantifying and interpreting uh, the image of the cell, when you go deeper than uh, let's say like the size of the cell or, you know, larger scale, let's say aspect ratio of the cell, where you go deep into what a uh, physician and an expert interprets from looking at uh, the, the nuclear, you know, heterogeneity or uh, multinucleation or chromatin structure of the cell, uh, it's very difficult to quantify uh, the interpretation of an expert. Um, and that's where we see um, AI and computer vision coming in, borrowing from other fields where uh, solving a lot of problems that have been uh, dominantly led by human uh, uh, interpretation, we believe that there's a role here as well. Like for example, if you, you're looking at captioning images or playing games or driving cars, these have been activities that have been very difficult to fit into what we call feature engineering, uh, because it's very difficult to define rules and define features to guide a decision that is much deeper than uh, what you can fit into a feature uh, engineering uh, regime. Um, and that's where AI and deep learning have shown a lot of promise to bring in automation and accuracy and efficiency. So this is a similar type of problem where you can go, go so far by bringing features, uh, you know, perhaps defining the boundary of the cell, maybe defining the boundary of the nucleus, but going beyond that and trying to deduce information from what all this information means uh, to diagnose and to identify a cell as a, an activated cell or a malignant cell or a, 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 a pluripotent cell is very difficult. So this is where our, our technology really comes in, and uh, we are trying to bring uh, a basically define a new field in biology by, by creating this new way to quantify interpretation of the image. Um, and we believe that AI beyond replacing uh, the inefficiencies of, of, of human interpretation can also reveal information that is hiding in plain sight in, in some of these cell images. Um, so um, this is in kind of an effort to make morphology, which is very qualitative, a digital marker um, so that we can also benefit from all the aspects of big data uh, regime and, and uh, trying to create uh, data sets that can help us correlate information and predict outcome uh, based on this rich data. Um, yeah, so, so this is basically the type of challenge that we're trying to address. Um, the subjectivity, the qualitative nature, um, and the limited uh, access to uh, clean visual information of the, of the, of the cells. And just to jump in, I just very excited by what you're talking about, Madison. So I wanted to ask, as you're talking about distinguishing cell states in addition to cell types, um, are you going to be looking at things over a period of time and distinguishing not only the morphology, but also the way the cell uh, moves and interacts with its environment as part of that distinguishing uh, morphological feature set out, out of curiosity? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we are right now at least mostly focused on single cell uh, visual features. So the intracellular uh, morphology, uh, the intercellular interactions and looking at, uh, you know, the, the progression of that throughout time within a tissue is kind of outside the boundary of, of what we do at deep cell. We are interested in looking at single cells. We're interested in looking at the uh, you know, the, the visual features of the cells within the boundary of the cell so that we can 
actually separate out and isolate cells of interest based on that. Uh, so it's, it's when you think about the spatial biology, where you're mostly looking at the interactions of the cells, um, that's complementary to what we do. Uh, at this point, we are, we are very much interested in uh, the, the intracellular uh, characteristics and, and uh, features. And uh, we believe that that brings a, a another aspect and another angle um, to, to cell biology, which is very difficult to uh, basically um, achieve with other methodologies. No, I absolutely agreed. And that's just part of my, part of why I was curious where, where you're starting, where you're going. But I think building in the single cell space makes, makes perfect sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I would have mentioned that earlier, you, you did a really great job overviewing all of these concepts in a very quick, clean and easy to understand um, manner. I, I, I think it is really exciting when you think about, um, you know, all of the axes that uh, this will be able to open up, you know, morphologics. And I think that's a great name to, to be able to explore and, and to draw insights when you can quantify, maybe identifying new types of morphological distinctions that you know, are invisible to the eye, right? If we think about genomics, you know, we, we were able to, se to sequence, um, uh, you know, genes way before we could have all of the, the insights to draw, you know, genome level uh, insights. And so being able to kind of take that into, um, uh, you know, the, the, the morphological space. And so, um, you know, in, in deep cells approach of doing this, of course, these very large, massive, clean and quantitative data sets did not exist prior. So um, as a starting point, DeepCell is, is undertaking this very large project to actually build out those data sets. So we'd love if you could share a bit more about that project, um, you know, I guess what led you to, to undertake it and then how you're planning on kind of applying it in these next few steps. Yeah, absolutely. It is a huge undertaking. And I think, uh, you know, going back uh, to, to the earlier days of, of the conception of, of Deep Cell, I remember we talked to uh, an investor who didn't end up investing in Deep Cell, which, who was fascinated by the technology, but kind of was, uh, you know, bringing out this point that there needs to, uh, you know, innovation needs to happen on, on many, many different fronts for this to happen. Um, and usually companies take on one area of, of development and the rest is, is kind of a given. Here we had to innovate across many, many different areas, uh, which was a correct assessment. Yet here we are and we have done that uh, and, and we're basically seeing uh, the, the fruits of, of all this um, hard work that, that our amazing team has put together. As you mentioned, one of the biggest undertakings here is, is the data itself, because you're looking at interpretation, when you're talking about interpretation, where you're talking about deep uh, neural net, and you're looking at an architecture that has many, many different layers, what it demands is a huge amount of data. And it's not trivial in the biological um, sample world to gather this uh, amount of data with this amount of, um, with this quality that we're gathering. So right now we have about 1.5 billion images in our repository, and that's what's powering training uh, networks that are deep, this deep. Beyond collecting the data, there's a lot of activities that happen after that uh, in cleaning up the data and labeling the data. And we have innovated and created infrastructure uh, for fast and accurate annotation uh, and weeding out uh, the unwanted or, or uh, bad uh, images, um, low quality images, for instance, and so forth. Um, and, and that has played very nicely into the ability to now train models that are generalizable, that are not specific to certain applications, but broadly visualize for you the heterogeneity of a sample in terms of its uh, morphological characteristics. Like for example, you can run a sample and what the technology shows you, uh, you know, immediately is how diverse your sample is in terms of the way that the cells within it look. How many populations do you have? And you can go and uh, with an unsupervised approach 
uh, without knowing what those populations are, you can go and pull out cells of interest, populations of interest, or you can just split your sample into its visually distinct subpopulations for the first time ever. So I, I am very much excited in the new insights that this can generate because we have taken an, uh, hyp a hypothesis free approach where we don't force to the models, look for this feature, look for a large nucleus, look for multinucleation, but we ask it, look for abnormality, look for diversity, look for heterogeneity and show me what's in there uh, that, that I didn't even know. So I think one of the very interesting areas to use this data is in that realm, in, in discovering the unknown unknowns. Another area that we are very much interested in is adding uh, morphology and, and visual interpretation to cell atlases. Um, so it, within the field, there's, there has been a lot of efforts in creating huge atlases of, uh, of different tissues and organelles so that we create a baseline, uh, for example, similar to the Human Genome Project uh, for what a normal tissue could look like, would look like, um, and uh, so that we can, we can now study disease tissues and patients more efficiently and easily. And one of the areas that we are very much interested in is to add uh, quantitative morphological interpretation to these atlases and form new atlases that include this in addition to uh, the genomic and transcriptomic and other omic uh, information. Um, so that's a second area. And lastly, I'm very much excited about creating this platform in a way that our users can develop their own applications and can share knowledge uh, across the ecosystem. So, um, you know, you're looking at uh, deep neural net models, when you go to supervised uh, regime, it, the supervised models are usually specific to, to certain applications. Like, for example, you're asking your model to find all the activated T cells for you, or you're acting the, asking the model to find all the malignant cells, or you're asking the model to find all the uh, granulocytes within a sample. So those models are um, tuned to a specific application and a specific question that a user is asking. What we are creating is a uh, platform that enables users to develop their own models uh, without knowing much about uh, neural net and deep learning, uh, clicking through uh, you know, uh, a workflow and, and basically developing their own applications and developing their own models to run on the system. So that's another area that uh, you know, having a huge amount of data and the infrastructure, infrastructure that we've built would enable us to uh, allow our users to achieve that level of interaction with the with the technology. Well, that's very exciting, and um, you know, as you were as mentioning a lot of these uh, kind of goals and, and, and areas that you're building your your uh, technology into. Um, a, a topic that kept coming into my mind and going a little bit off script is balancing the scales um, at which all of this could be done. And so, when we think of like genomics, um, of course, you know, you would measure a particular sequence, and you could do it across the whole genome, or you could do a certain region, you know, maybe there's a difference in scale there, certainly in size, but morphologically, you can zoom in way far, zoom out, it's extremely deep. So how are you balancing that? And how do you expect to like, uh, derive unique insights for this, these three kind of general goals that you've just uh, mentioned? Yeah, so I, I think you're, you're pointing out a very critical, uh, you know, difference here between the way that uh, a, a, an image is characterized or interpreted and something like uh, genomics. You have bases, you know, in, in, in genomic analysis and what you demand of, of a uh, DNA sequencer is to accurately quantify what you know is there. Here, you're looking at interpreting images. So even, uh, you know, that the, the, the uh, gold standard or the baseline or the ground truth is is very much shaky. You can look at a cell with a 10x uh, objective or magnification or 100x or a 400x and, and you are interpreting uh, things very differently depending on how you're looking at it. Another angle to look at it is that you may look at samples from different points of view and you want the interpretation of, of your image to reflect that. For example, we can look at a blood sample just being interested in the state of activation of the immune cells with a blood sample, or we may want to look at the rare or uncommon cells that are floating within there, um, maybe cancer cells, maybe cells from fibrotic tissue, etc. So from one lens, you don't care about the diversity of the immune cells, you want everything but 
from one angle, you are looking at the diversity of, of the immune cell. From one angle, you're just looking at the activation of one specific subtype of cell. So again, the uh, lens that, uh, that, that you put on to characterize uh, your sample is very much different. Uh, and it's kind of a completely different way of thinking about samples than uh, when you look at uh, genomic profiling of, 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 uh, of a sample where a lot of that in interpretation comes after the fact. You do your genomic profiling, now you want to you know, gather insights based on all that profiling. So a lot of that teasing apart the data, throwing out things that you don't care about comes after the fact. Here, everything is upfront. You want to look at cells with that lens. You don't want to look at you know, the resolution of 100x where you're just interested in, uh, in, in, in a uh, distinction between a monocyte and, and a lymphocyte, for instance. Um, so that is the basis of a lot of challenges that we faced internally. And I think uh, a, a question about what are some of the bigger challenges is exactly striking the right balance between generalizability and specificity. You want to provide your users with a general sense of morphology, yet you want it to be useful for their application of interest. So what we have done is that we have trained these general, what we call unsupervised models, where you don't care about the space of applications, but what the model shows you is, a, is an overall view of heterogeneity of your sample. What, what you can see in the system, for instance, is that you run your sample, you look at a plot where it shows you the distinct populations. You can go and click in and zoom in within each of those populations and get more distinct and refined uh, fine grain separations. But from the first view, you can at least see, okay, this sample is more or less heterogeneous than the other sample. And you can go and look at the like representative images within each of those groups. And you can understand uh, what your sample look like, looks like. Are there cells that you didn't expect to see in this sample? Or are there cells in sample A that don't exist in sample B? So that's the generalizability. And then what I talked about, about um, letting our users train their own models is the specificity piece. So you can train and assign supervised models to that general model based on your specific application. So imagine I run a sample, uh, let's say I run 10 samples, I see that there is a population showing up in half of them and not the other half. I can go and train a model on that specific population that's supervised and I can pull out that population from the next set, 100 samples that I that I run through the system. So that's kind of where uh, we ended up with striking the balance between generalizability and specificity to provide that level of um, uh, flexibility for our users to uh, be able to learn something without knowing anything, but also be able to pull out cells that they actually know what they are and, and cells that they were looking for and they have generated some hypothesis around. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I mean, so much that you can even think about in this, like drawing relationships between morphology at the cell membrane level and then morphology at the, uh, you know, mitochondrial structural level for different kind of uh, you know, structural mutations, et cetera, and, and being able to have unique uh, heterogeneity at those types of axes and then back that onto kind of traditional multiomics approaches and come up with very unique and stratified patient subpopulations. So, um, yeah, no, extremely interesting. And, um, you know, uh, taking this a step further as well, could you maybe mention um, in, in how you're viewing it, how this could be used to impact diagnostic testing, therapeutics, and um, I guess, just broadly speaking, uh, medicine. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think the role of morphology and cell imaging in, in, uh, in diagnostic and, and in therapeutic and overall in cell, bi cell biology is not debatable. Like, still gold standard for a lot of uh, cancer detection uh, workflows is inspection of, of 
biopsies, let's say, uh, you know, uh, tissue biopsies uh, of patients and so forth, uh, visually. Um, in cell biology, I think one of the first things that the biologist looks at when they have a culture of cells is, is how they look like. So you can detect whether the cells are viable, whether they are healthy, whether they're, they're responding uh, to, to an agent uh, that, that uh, you are growing them with. Uh, you can detect whether your cells are actually differentiating correctly by looking at them. Um, so the role of, of uh, visual inspection in uh, diagnostic, therapeutic, uh, detecting drug response, direct, detecting cytotoxicity of, of a certain drug, uh, detecting uh, development uh, of, of cells and so forth is, is very much known in the field. What we do is, is, is to quantify it and to scale it and to standardize it. And standardization of this data starts from very, very beginning, starts from sample prep. Uh, you know, you look at the pathology slides from different centers, even the way that they were stained and they were put on a, a, a um, slide and they were uh, imaged, even the imaging methodology uh, and device has a great impact on the quality um, and type of images that you generate. So it starts all the way from sample prep and of course the way that an expert uh, or, or user looks at the cell has a very uh, you know significant impact on, on what the outcome is. So we want to make that all standard and we want to make that all quantifiable and scalable so that you can you end up with a with a data set that you can trust you end up with a data set that you can now ask questions uh, based off of you end up with a data set that now you can integrate with uh, genomics and transcriptomics and proteomics um, so i think the role of the technology in diagnostic and therapeutic is kind of bringing this very rich information to the next level um, so that you, it, it, in my mind would explode uh, the, the um, amount of uh, insight, new insight that's going to be generated either in isolation or in integration with other uh, modalities. Well, that's a perfect segue to the next question. We'd love your thoughts on how you view this um, kind of morphologics axis integrating in with um, some of the uh, current existing multi-omics technologies. Yeah, uh, yeah, this is one of the areas that you're most excited about. Uh, so in talking about bringing morphology as a new ohm, a new way to look at the cells, I think what we have seen over and over again is that you're looking at a, at a new cut, uh, at a new dimension, at an orthogonal set of information to understand a biological sample. Um, so we have seen over and over again, for instance, in, in tissue biopsy samples, that, that a group of cells that may be molecularly very similar to one another have very distinct and diverse set of mor morphological features. So we see multiple cl morphological clusters within a, a group of cells that are molecularly similar and vice versa. So you're looking at information that sometimes is overlapping, but sometimes it's very much telling you a new story. And I think that's where the excitement is, where you have new insights to work with when you have where you have new information uh, that that was not possible to uh, interpret uh, or or gather beforehand. So um, I think one of the biggest uh, opportunities of the technology is bringing this new view in a quantitative standard uh, uh, and, and uh, easy to deal with, uh, easy to work with manner. Um, another area that that is very interesting in my mind is that I think the approach of sorting cells uh, based on distinct visual features or based on an ohm could help do multiomic analysis. So right now, th there has been a lot of interest to doing um, transcriptomic and proteomic and, and met metabolomic and, and genomic analysis. And a lot of these information are in silos. There has been a lot of interest to uh, integrate the information. There has been a lot of uh, activities to try to understand how to link these different pieces of data together, how to figure out where is this group of cell that, that I'm identifying in the transcriptomic profile and the proteomic profile and then the genomic profile. And I think this platform can provide a new and a unique way to, to create that link in the following manner. You can look at the bi biological sample, you can look at the visually distinct populations, you can separate them out physically without knowing what they are. And you can do molecular analysis on those populations. And this by itself for the first time can provide a link between 
at least a few ohms, which is not possible when you do your RNA sequencing analysis. So when you do your transcriptomic analysis, you can embark on a new population of cells. It's very difficult to go and pull those cells out. You need to develop a set of uh, a cocktail of biomarkers that may or may not exist to pull out those cells from a separate sample. Uh, and, and sometimes you, you don't even find that population that you identified on your transcriptomic profile. Here, the analysis and the sorting happens si simultaneously. So you don't have to uh, do it on a second set of uh, samples, or you don't have to go and develop a whole new uh, workflow and, uh, or uh, molecular um, agents to pull out these cells. So I think a second opportunity, other than acting as a new way to look at cells, could be a link to help do multiomic analysis uh, eventually. Well, that's extremely impactful. I mean, feeding back into kind of the academic space, guiding a lot of new basic research, and then also um, when it's applied. And, 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 you know, at Alix, we've noticed that there's a, a new class of companies whose uh, business models are, are really uh, being differentiated on their ability to stratify patients, as you mentioned, either on a transcriptomic axis, genomics we've seen in, in cancer biology a lot. Um, but as these new omics uh, technologies and, and real world evidence is building up, we've seen these new precision medicine companies um, that have been coming into this space. And so we're curious if uh, you consider Deep Cell a precision medicine company or a precision medicine enabling company. Um, so I think um, overall, the approach of uh, our approach of hy hypothesis free uh, analysis is very much aligned with, with the promise of precision medicine, which is don't paint all the samples or all the, all the patients or all the same cells with the same brush. Um, I, I think the approach to kind of let the machine or let the intelligence or let the, uh, you know, crowdsourced data tell you what's in there within a certain sample is something that's very much aligned with precision medicine, in, you know, conceptually. In terms of applications, we have a broad set of applications that the platform supports. Some of them you can categorize as more precision medicine enabling, meaning that they are upstream of the process, upstream of the interaction with the patient in that you can go and, and fiddle with a, uh, let's say a biological sample, a tissue biopsy and identify populations uh, of unknown cells uh, and characterize them and, and, and study the role of these cells in, in the progression of disease or, or response to a certain therapeutic. Some applications are closer to the patient. I think one of the ultimate, very interesting applications of this technology uh, in precision medicine, in terms of interacting with the patient and diagnosis is what we had conceptualized with you and NIR in the very early days of con uh, you know, uh, conceptualizing deep cell. And that is the following. So we have uh, a way uh, with the unsupervised models to identify cells that don't belong don't belong, meaning that the cells, a small group of cells within this sample don't look like the rest of the sample, or there are cells in this sample that didn't exist in the previous samples that you collected from this patient. So I think one of the very exciting applications in precision medicine of this technology is if you have time point samples from a certain patient and something changes, you can raise flags, you can separate those cells, you can pull them out and study them further. And this was the idea of uh, you know, uh, the ultimate application of, of deep cell in, uh, let's say, um, blood screening, you know, ca early cancer screening, identifying abnormal cells, um, non-belonging cells within a biological sample without even knowing what they would be. Uh, so, you know, th this is one of the areas that I think as the uh, data sets become bigger and more diverse, uh, and the confidence of the models in what is a normal blood sample and what blood sample cell and what doesn't look normal in a blood sample, for example, uh, would, would make this uh, feasible in the future. Well, as you've described, Deep Cell has been pioneering an incredibly exciting approach in deriving a lot of novel insights in the single cell analysis space. Uh, and so, that's also supported. You're recently closing a very impressive $73 million Series B. So congratulations. Thank you. What, talking about that, have been some of the greatest challenges uh, at this, up until this point? Uh, 
Um, I, I will point out too. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I talked a little bit about the technology, uh, but I don't think I did justice in like really pointing out what are the, all the challenges that that uh, we we had to solve here. Um, and I think one thing that I see that's different with Deep Cell compared to other biotech companies is that you're innovating across many many different fronts. A lot of times when you look at look at a uh, biotech company, the IP or the core of the technology is one area. Uh, let's say it's chemistry, and everything serves that. We don't have the same situation here. We are innovating in microfluidics, in optics, in AI, in, in software engineering, uh, in the way that we collect data, uh, in, in doing bioinformatics and linking all of that in together. So one of the biggest challenges is recruiting for talent that's A players across the board. And we don't compromise on that because we are innovating in all these areas. We need to have amazing talent and A players across the board. Um, and it's not easy. Um, so a lot of times you see that a company is very much strong in, in the caliber of their uh, talent pool within a certain area and the rest are fine. You know, they're supporting that. And, and that is one of the biggest challenges at Deep Cell to gather all this amazing A player talent across uh, a table and, and have them, let them innovate, let them collaborate. Uh, let them speak each other's language, which sometimes is not easy. Um, so I think that's one of the biggest challenges um, we have faced, and I think we will continue to face at Deep Cell as we scale the team. The second one is uh, what I think we covered. You know, we have created something that is not out there. Uh, and we have created something that through tens or maybe a hundred of deep conversations, we realize has a broad set of applications, some of which have nothing to do with the other. So striking the right balance between having some general uh, interpretation and information to share with the user and being specific enough so that it's useful for them has been a huge challenge as well. Um, so we have gone through many, many different phases of, of trying to modify the way that we look at the technology from the perspective of a customer and a user, and, and we are converging on something that we, we and our early uh, users are feeling very much excited about. So that has been a, a second uh, big challenge with, with the product and the, tech and, and the platform itself. And I can imagine that has also led to some pretty phenomenal accomplishments. That convergence you were talking about, building such an interdisciplinary and incredible uh, team. Is there anything you really want to highlight here uh, that you're excited by in terms of accomplishments, milestones, success? Yeah, I think the team, uh, to my surprise, is working very well together. Uh, we have focused a lot on, on how to build a company that has a culture that supports what the, what the platform and the product actually needs, which is collaboration, which is integration. Uh, and I think it's not easy to achieve that when you have biologists that are speaking a certain language and, and data scientists that are speaking a completely different one. Uh, but to my surprise, uh, and, and uh, crediting all the amazing folks that that are, you know, as I said, A players and, and uh, superstars at their own game, uh, but still find a way to work together and share their knowledge across the board, take time out of their busy, busy day to uh, educate others uh, is, I think, one of the biggest accomplishments as a company. Uh, in other areas, I think um, uh, they as I mentioned, this whole deep architecture, deep neural net architecture demands certain things. It demands a lot of clean data and building infrastructure to collect this data, to clean it up, to annotate it, uh, to integrate it has been a huge undertaking that I think uh, it, it will bear fruit more and more as, as we launch the product and, and we uh, take it to the market. Um, and it also demands an ability to integrate this deep neural net into the hardware to do real time analysis. So, in some sense, you know, when you look at uh, self driving cars, the response time that you have from seeing an object to making a decision could be a few milliseconds, maybe uh, up to a second, perhaps. Here we are in the realm of microseconds. So, even in creating this deep networks and being able to run them in real time, meaning in the microsecond uh, regime, has been a huge undertaking. That again, building this level of complexity and this, this level of resolution uh, in the images demands that. Um, so that has been on the technology side, another big uh, uh, accomplishment. And I think um, 
what I have been most surprised by was uh, the learnings that we had across, uh, along the, the, the way. So we were kind of playing in this uncharted territory. We don't label ourselves. We are looking at unlabeled bright field cell images at a high resolution. And time and time again, we were surprised by, by by what we were seeing. Sometimes we were seeing something on these morphology plots where we, we went in and looked at the literature and rediscovered some biology. Like for example, we rediscovered that uh, fetal cells with trisomy 21 look different than fetal cells that are normal. They look different. I mean, they look incredibly different than, 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 than the other. You look at non-invasive prenatal testing and it still relies on, on genomic testing, right? Whereas you look at the image, it's obvious. This is a trisomy 21 cell. We, had, we went in with no expectation on that. We went in, for example, for this application, trying to separate out fetal cells from maternal cells, for instance, but we saw that you know, these disease samples actually look different. And that's just one example. So I think another interesting accomplishment for, for me was, Going in, I wasn't sure how much information we would be able to get out of unlabeled uh, cells that no one else in the field perhaps had worked with. And we were surprised by how much information, even you know, standardizing the imaging can bring to the human eye, let alone uh, what AI and, and, and computer vision can achieve beyond that. Absolutely. And um, you know, at this point, we've chatted a lot about, uh, you know, the history of Deep Cell, a lot of the challenges you've gone through, exciting applications, and um, some of the accomplishments as well. So we'd love to, to hear a bit about what's coming next for Deep Cell. Yeah, so we have been uh, playing a lot within our own four walls so far. I think uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, next steps for us is commercialization, bringing the technology uh, to um, the masses beyond uh, a few collaborators and, and partners who have been helping and testing out the system so far. Um, so that's one. Uh, as I mentioned, building the ecosystem and re releasing it to the users so that they can train their own applications, they can build their, their own applications and share their knowledge across the ecosystem is another one that I'm very much uh, excited about. And lastly, there are a few key advancements on the technology side uh, that are very exciting uh, that, that we're in feasibility mode right now uh, and are going to be part of uh, future releases uh, that, that we will announce in due course. Um, Absolutely. And um, perhaps it's a bit early to tell, but do you foresee Deep Cell um, turning into more of a diagnostics or therapeutics company in the future? Do you see it staying more on the um, kind of molecular insight uh, realm? At this point, I think there's a lot to be learned and there's a lot to be discovered uh, by staying close to many, many different applications and staying close to our users who are excited about specific areas of innovation and providing the general capability and the platform and an ability to share knowledge, uh, bring in other omic data uh, to really create rich cell atlases, to create rich data sets uh, that can inform what can be done with the technology. So I, I think at this point, we're still uh, you know, very much excited about this whole area of innovation and adding to the database, adding to the cell atlas so that we can benefit from the breadth of the different cell types and the different samples uh, that come into our, what we call the deep cell atlas uh, for the benefit of everyone. Uh, but it's yet to be seen where the company will uh, evolve uh, as, as, uh, as we move past this phase and as we enable our users to bring in and share data across the ecosystem. Absolutely. And, um, you know, like you said, there's so much impact and innovation that is to be had on this forefront. Uh, so we'll be very excited to, to follow and, and stay on top of what's, what's going on at this interface. So um, we'll pass to Chris for our final section. Thank you, Michael. And before we come to a close, a few just rapid fire questions to cap things off, Madison. So we talked about what's coming next for Deep Cell, but let's talk a little bit further into the future. Imagine that it's 2050. Where is deep cell at that point? How is how are the morpholo uh, morpholomics impacting medicine or abilities to profile disease and to provide treatment? Absolutely. Um, so I think you know, moving you know a few years in the future, I think there's going to be a lot more data. I think there's going to hopefully be a lot more ohms 
there's always interest in gaining more and more information because biology is so complex, because there's still a lot of unknowns that are not answered by uh, the current uh, technologies and current approaches to understand biology. Um, and I think it's, you know, gathering this, this, uh, these analytes information is going to be cheaper and cheaper. So by definition, there's going to be a lot more uh, to handle. Another aspect, which is kind of reflected in what we do at DeepSell, is the role of AI and deep learning, which is a constantly evolving information uh, regime, right? Um, so what I'm hoping to see is, is that there is a way for the masses to benefit from this constant learning. And right now, the fact that all a lot of this data is isolated and a lot of the new learnings are not really reflected in, in the way that we treat disease or we uh, diagnose disease is, is um, uh, is something that I'm hoping to change. And, you know, all the red tape and considerations around data privacy and all of that is going to be a big part of this whole thing. But I think technologies like deep cell that are evolving all the time and with every single new image that comes through the models are learning new things uh, are going to have a huge impact in pushing the boundary to actually bring this insight and information back uh, to, to our, our healthcare. Uh, um, processes. Um, so that's what, I'm, what my hope is. And uh, another hope is that actually deep cell serves a, purpose, a role in integrating the data and in, in integrating the uh, information that, are, that is in silo through its unique approach to sort cells uh, hypothesis, in a hypothesis-free manner. So as we take that and think about the interdisciplinarity that's required, the bridging of hardware, software, wetware, and in many cases, as you're describing policy. Uh, do you have any advice for current graduate students, maybe even undergraduates, professors, who are interested in really driving the cutting edge of the space and possibly launching their own companies? Yeah, I have too many, <laughs> perhaps, but uh, maybe I'll just uh, make it short and, and just stick to two uh, that that's coming to mind uh, more importantly than others. I think if you are dealing with a with an interdisciplinary uh, kind of technology uh, or approach, and uh, one of the key uh, advices that I have is to surround yourselves with the best. You're not expected to, and you cannot do it all by yourselves. Uh, and it's important to have a group of people who are at the caliber that, you know, the technology and the approach really demands uh, and, and that are with you on that vision and are excited, as excited as you are. So always, regardless of what you're thinking of, surrounding yourself with the best of the best is, is something that will go a long way. Um, and, and second thing that I would say is that if you feel strongly about something, just do it. Uh, I see a lot of folks who are uh, brilliant and have brilliant ideas, but keep second guessing themselves and considering, oh, should I go to industry for two years and then come back to this and gain some? I think uh, those could be valid, uh, you know, uh, ways to think about things. But uh, if you feel strongly about something and you have the conviction, just do it. Uh, you know, use the academic environment to test your hypothesis and just do some initial work uh, that's going to be otherwise very expensive when you are out of that environment, but I would just jump in. Oh, that's an incredibly empowering message and one that I know many of our audience will greatly appreciate. Um, as we wrap up, do you have any other closing thoughts, shameless plugs, anything you'd like to use this platform to help our audience here? Uh, so, I mean, I think going back to, to the 2050 question, I think uh, one thing that I constantly think about is that it's a high, uh, you know, it's highly possible that, that in 10 years we're going to have uh, in silico and in vitro versions of ourselves. Uh, and I think uh, that would also greatly impact the way that, for example, we do clinical studies so that you don't have to keep recruiting people when there is new insights and new learnings. You can go and uh, create your uh, in silico patient pool. Uh, and, and run it and, and really accelerate the way that we learn things. And I think what we do at DeepSol, keeping all these 
all this data in our cloud, uh, paying a big price for it. Uh, I see a lot of value though in, in, in keeping the data and in integrating the data and in creating these in silico models uh, that, uh, as I said, because the rate of uh, learning is so fast, it's gonna bear fruit uh, much more significantly than, than the process that we're going through right now. Uh, so that's one thing that I think I was left out that I wanted to share. Um, and shamelessly, I, I just wanna share that, that you know, we're hiring. We have tens of uh, open positions. Uh, if you check out our website, deepcell.com, you'll find them. Uh, I would say that there's, uh, you know, only a very special type of candidate would thrive at DeepSell. But if you think, if you think you're that, that person, uh, I uh, promise you it's going to be the best uh, career opportunity perhaps in your lifetime. Uh, you know, being um, surrounded by, by amazing folk, folks across many, many different uh, areas of innovation is, is a great opportunity and bringing something very unique uh, to the world of uh, life sciences is is, uh, is going to be very um, uh, you know fulfilling for for uh, for your career. Awesome thing. Well, I think we can all resonate with especially as you're painting such a phenomenal picture of what's soon to come in the future. So thank you again, Madison, for an absolutely fantastic episode. We're very grateful for your time and your willingness to share so much more of what you're doing over at Deep Cell, what the team is building and where you think things are going. Thank you again. Thank you. Really enjoyed the conversation.